There you go. <laughs> you look there fabulous. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's see here. Well, hopefully, uh, McGay will join us shortly. Um, but I would like to welcome you to the panel on collaborative world building and gaming. Um, we have been seeing a lot of changes in games, some of them coming from the GM-less games and some coming from uh, the more narrative ones that have put forward a lot of different models for sharing. Oop, we just lost Brad. I'm sure he'll be back. Um, but one of the things that we wanted to talk about was what are some ways that you can bring collaboration and your players into um, your games more. And so I'm going to start um, by introducing some of our participants. So we have with us Ben Robbins who wrote Microscope and Kingdom. Currently Kingdom is in Kickstarter. It's got a couple days to go. Um, but he's already reached the goal so that will definitely be a reality for everyone who has subscribed. And we also have with us uh, Brad Murray who has done some awesome work on Diaspora and on Hollow Point and is working on Swallowmere right now. So um, and as well, uh, Lowell Francis, who is with us, he is a GM. Uh, he blogs on Age of Ravens about his gaming, particularly about bringing uh, collaborative experiences into his games. Also, he uh, works on the Play on Target podcast, and um, he is here as a GM. So first I'm going to start with Lowell just to have him talk a little bit about some of the collaborative things that he has been bringing into RPGs and his uh, inspirations. Uh, well, I guess what I'll say is is that uh, part of the reason when Sherry and I were talking about doing the panel is that we looked at what's happened in the last three or four years for us in terms of gaming, and we've been playing solidly uh, together since 95 and I was playing long before that um, and it was seeing Brad Murray's work in Diaspora uh, the the system building and Ben Robbins microscope there that I was like well I run a lot of games uh, I, I have a lot of stories and, and, and stuff um, and because I am running four or five campaigns it would be interesting to do some things that might uh, for, in my mind I was like well shift the work Maybe, maybe see what, what other people have to do and maybe make it a little easier uh, for myself. And that was my original thought. Um, and then I did it uh, to be lazy uh, and <laughs> discovered that, in fact, uh, the benefits were huge. Uh, that by bringing the players in on the process, uh, they, they engaged more fully with the game. Uh, they loved it. They were terrified at first. Um, but now I have really come to, to em embrace that, and we've done that uh, in several ongoing campaigns. We've got uh, uh, one going this, this evening, in fact, that's been going for two years based on the group sitting down and coming up with a world using microscope, and we've just played that since then uh, with ideas and things that never would have occurred to me. Uh, uh, there are concepts in there that I wouldn't have come up with and in fact actually work against my usual sense of, of what I want in a fantasy game um, but I was able to to look at those and integrate them and make a much stronger game from that um, and that's become a tool across our all of our games more collaborative character building collaborative world building history building city building all of those things and uh, uh, I think it's made for uh, games that the players are engaged in more strongly than than they were five or six years ago. Okay. Now, Brad, I know that um, you worked with uh, Diaspora. You wrote that, and essentially that just starts out right away with the players um, making up the star system that they're going to play in. So that isn't really part of the fate, per se, that was the system that you used and yet you brought that in and it, it was really kind of revelationary for I mean revelatory for us but could you talk a little bit about like how you came to choosing to do that and then some of the other sorts of collaboration that you've brought sure. into the games sure there there's actually two origins to that um, the first was that we before we encountered fate at all which would have been in the form of spirit of the century at the time um, we were playing burning wheel I believe 
and somebody drew my attention to Universalis, which is kind of a universal storytelling system with with uh, all of the mechanism basically supporting who gets the narrative and, and, and what kinds of things they get to get to say and who can interrupt and so on. And our first contact with that was to build a world uh, to play Burning Wheel in. So we basically used Universalis to create uh, a mythology for a fictional world, and then we began to play Burning Wheel in that. So when we decided that uh, we wanted to take our experience with Spirit of the Century and move that to uh, a traveler emulator, so originally Diaspora was Spirit of the Far Future, and it was it was literally just Traveler with fate. Um, and then when, when Mongoose uh, announced their purchase of the license, which made it exclusive for Traveler, we abandoned our idea of buying a Traveler license and, and actually publishing under that name and rewrote everything as Diaspora. So we wanted to incorporate what we'd learned from Universe Alice, but simplify it dramatically and use sort of similar tools that are available at your fate to do it. And at roughly the same time, um, a couple of guys in my R&D team at work uh, we're working on a tough graph theory problem, uh, an algorithm to create a simple connected graph. And the algorithm that I came up with for them to use was the simple process that we now use to call a cluster in Diaspora. So it guarantees certain features about the graph that were desirable in this project that I had elsewhere. And it turns out they're highly desirable in a, in a small uh, universe of game space to play with them. So I, I owe a lot of people uh, for the ideas that, that came to be the cluster system for Diaspora, and I'm really pleased to see it catch on and evolve all over the place elsewhere. Certainly games that I'm working on now uh, all use some kind of very well, not all, but, but many of them use some kind of variation of that same system, uh, expanding on on uh, ways to add attributes to the connections between nodes and, and ways to add data to the nodes and so on so that you get a lot of emergent uh, features of, of any given cluster. So there, you're actually working with a sort of a, a set of connections and defining how those connections are built and everything as much as, as uh, just a collaboration of, oh, let's put these beautiful ideas together. There's yeah. actually, there's mechanics and reasons for why things are. I mean, the idea was that each, each player would own at least one of these nodes and be able to elaborate it without too much interference or, or guidance from a referee. Um, but it was really the connections between these things that made the story balloon out of the culture. The stats for the nodes give kind of a, um, a springboard for each player to, to define what they expect the node to be about, the cluster or the system or the, the plane and our fantasy variant. But it's the connections that start to bring together everybody's ideas and collide them together and make all kinds of uh, unexpected stories. Ah, beautifully engineered narrative, then. <laughs> um, ben, I, I have to ask you, in some ways, your games are sort of the world building, but the RPG part of it is not, is not right in there. It is more you're building the story, at least to read it to begin with. Right. Um, but, yeah, your ideas on collaboration are so fascinating. I just, uh, can you talk about those a little bit? Well, I mean, it's, it's funny. If you think about it, uh, you know, I come from a very traditional D&D background since the dawn of time. Uh, and if you think about what has happened over the past decades, if you were playing D&D in 1985, uh, the dungeon master was spending time by themselves before the game preparing this world, and then we would all come together and sit down and play. But those, both of those processes were 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 integral to the game. Um, and with Microscope, you do both of those things. You just do them together at the same time. And you don't have like a step A, build the world, step B, play the world. You kind of keep moving back and forth between those two phases. Somebody might be making um, large chunks of history, periods and events, and then someone else uh, might say, okay, now we're going to do a scene. And then you jump in and out and right back and forth between those two things. But I think what throws people is because we're so used to seeing those two things separated when you see the world building at the table, a lot of people will say that. They'll say, oh, it's not a role-playing game. And I say, look at that huge chapter where you play scenes and you pick characters. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, but the other thing is so much more of a big deal. I think it's that they're kind of distracted by the power they have 
to create this game world at the table. And so they, they just kind of blot out the, the scene part. Or what frequently happens is that people will be so kind of caught up in the newness of the ability to, to do these big things that they will just skip role-playing scenes because they're so excited about being able to make large stuff. Um, but as far as the collaboration goes, yeah, I mean, the entire premise of the game is... Like when I was a GM, I really enjoyed making worlds. I had a lot of fun with that. And the, the core question is, how can you share that in a way that is constructive? Um, when I was a GM, I think I had a lot of bad habits. Uh, it's very easy as the GM to uh, veto people, or to even very subtly veto people, where, where you realize as a, as a person in creative authority at the table very small things you can do. It's just a faint look on your face, a faint tilt of your head is is subtly telling people you don't like their idea. And if you're in charge and you're the one who basically has kind of this assumed uh, a, a power given to you by the group that you're the one whose creative ideas kind of win, you can kind of really have this awkward situation where you're sabotaging people's um, input without really ever intending to. Um, so that was part of the goal of Microscope is to say, like, how can we overcome that? How can, how can I stop being a problem at the table? How can I let other people participate in a way that's um, productive? And the, the thing with, I guess, the, like the topic of this panel, the idea of uh, world building but then GMing in a shared world, I think the, the, the dangerous first step is that as a GM uh, sitting at that table in this cl creative collaborative process is kind of recognizing that even if theoretically on paper you're all equal, it's quite possible that socially you still have a lot more power to influence what's going on. And to, and to kind of face that head on to talk about that and to, and to decide exactly where that boundary is. Because the worst thing I think you can possibly have is a case where uh, we have agreed openly to one set of procedures, but then in fact subtly we're engaging in this kind of like, well, I don't really like that. So, you know, you're, you know what I mean? You're, you're not openly saying like, nope, you, you don't have the authority to say that. But you're kind of, oh, well, I am the GM. I don't really kind of want to do that. You know, it can get very, uh, I think, socially destructive if you're not careful about that. I, you know, I can, I can see that. And actually, it's one of those things that, uh, that we've talked about where when we brought this up to people and said, well, this is a way that you can handle these things. They go, well, there's just some games I don't want to play. Or I don't want to run. And that's, I mean, that's right. a legitimate right. reaction if that's how you feel and you're afraid that your players are going to bring those to the table. And yet, I don't... Well, well be, be overt about it. Yeah, be overt. Yeah, yeah. Be, be overt. Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. that's, that's fair. You can say, no, I want to run this kind of game, but let's build it within that framework. I mean, constraints exactly. are part of collaboration and right. creativity. Be, right. If you're honest and open about what you like and dislike, you don't have a problem. It's when, I think it's when you're, you dislike something, but for whatever reasons, because of the rules you've said you're agreeing to, you, you are maybe having to do something you don't like. And so you kind of just give those little hints. And that, I think, can lead to a very um, uncomfortable situation where people don't really know what the rules are anymore. They don't know what, whether they're allowed to give input or whether they're really waiting to see if the, the GM agrees to what they're doing. You know, and that brings up uh, an interesting idea in collaboration, in this sort of shared, in any part of the shared process of play, uh, the idea of mechanics that allow uh, how do you say, safe collaboration or fair collaboration, that sort of idea of what are some of those mechanics, for instance, that you've used with uh, um, with your world building. I'm going to well, ask Ben because I know you have a, a particular approach to that. Yeah, and there's there's um, there's kind of two, I think what you just touched upon was actually two kind of very different things. Safe, uh, safe and collaborative are very different. Um, safe, like there's a long history of... Um, like lines and veils going all the way back to Sorcerer, to Ron Edwards' works, where he really kind of nailed down the how do we socially deal with situations in which people have crossed a line or have introduced material that makes people uncomfortable. Um, and that is, I feel that's required reading for any game group anywhere. It's such a useful set of tools to have to say, I'm okay with that being in the fiction, but I don't want to see it. There's a whole, there's a whole sphere for that. And that trumps, I think, any game rules ever. Uh, so I run Story Game Seattle which is a weekly, even more than weekly, uh, meetup. Total Strangers come in and play a variety of story games, uh, and we, every week, bring that up. We, we lecture people. We give a little spiel and say, 
The deal is, if you feel uncomfortable, we, we beg of you to say that you would like to cut that from the game. We have a little procedure we go through. And we get everyone to agree that they're going to do that, and that if someone else does that, they will obey it. Um, so that's the safe side, which I think is critical to any game. doesn't matter if you're GMing it, if it's you're playing first edition D&D, it's not a bad idea to know those are options. Um, the collaborative side, I guess, is totally much more procedural rules based. Because some, I mean, some games like uh, Brad, you were talking about Universalis. Universalis is very much based on the idea that um, you're winning narrative authority through um, currency, right? You're, you're spending points to veto other people potentially, and the collaboration balance is through the currency you have. Um, and other games will say. Like, like in Microscope, for example, you just can't even do that. You can't veto somebody based on preference. You can only veto them based on them uh, basically going against what has already been established or breaking one of the other rules. So different games are going to operate very differently, I think, for, for how that works. And finding the, the zone that you want to collaborate in is, is critical. And Brad, what would you say about the mechanics like in Diaspora? Because in some ways, yours are engineered. It's what would work. Is well, the impression. Yeah, in, in our case, again, going back to Universalis, because that, that was our launching point, uh, the first thing that you do in, in Universalis is establish the tenets of the story that you're going to tell. And, and everybody agrees what those tenets are going to be, and they agree to be constrained by those tenets as you go forward in the story. So in, in Diaspora, all of that's implicit. You know, there there is a sort of... Uh, not so much a setting, but a genre, and there are... There are uh, statements in the book about what sorts of technologies exist, what sorts of technologies don't exist. Uh, and so all of those those core tenets of the hard SF, or nearly hard SF in Diaspora, are all, all laid out elsewhere in the book. So it becomes implicit to the, to the collaborative process. And um, as, as Ben alludes to, there's sort of lots of room for collision in there. You know, lots of people play Diaspora differently. They play it all over the place, from very soft SF space opera to much harder than we envisioned it, uh, using the cluster just as a series of planets, omitting fast and light travel altogether, and so on. And so it's one of the things that I think is actually lacking in Diaspora, is an explicit call out of those, uh, of those tenets, and the idea that those have to be established up front, and everybody kind of agrees to them, and then agrees that they have all the authority they want within them. That's all implicit in Diaspora. And, uh, with all of the work that's happened in collaborative world building after Diaspora, there's plenty we've learned that, that we would add to it. Uh, although I think I'd have to find a way to cut 30 or 40,000 words from Diaspora. <laughs> <laughs> and Lowell, in lecture, actual play, have there been some things that you've had to change or consider with those ideas? Uh, I think... One of the things is, is because our group has been around and playing together for a very long time, we've already got built up a whole set of trust issues um, that we've uh, established that balance of trust, um, which is often uh, uh, a question that goes on in, in a lot of these games is, is they're building rules and mechanics uh, to to build that trust thing. It, we, you know, we were talking about a burning wheel earlier, and Sherry and I have been discussing our reaction to that in that when I read Burning Wheel, Burning Wheel felt to me like there were a lot of rules and mechanics that were put in there to take place of the sort of natural trust that grows up in, in a group. Um, uh, because we play together, we know how, uh, how we can... Uh, 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 spend our time. We know what what we play well with each other with. Um, whereas something like Burning Wheel uh, has a set of of hard mechanics to do that. Um, and so I do think that there's there's a there's a big difference uh, in in presenting this cold to a new group versus uh, presenting to a group that you've played with for a long time. Um, you know, I'll go back to what Brad just said about the implicit stuff. One of the things I see as a sort of a Recur recurring uh, objection and criticism to shared and say yes approaches is that people feel like, well, then anybody can do anything. 
and that guy can do awful things and blah blah blah, blah. and there's always a response to to that rather than thinking about sort of what the, the possibility is people worry about because things aren't explicit that well of course they wouldn't do it but somebody else might you know be awful about it and to give a very personal thing when I first went to do microscope and said okay we're gonna do a campaign we're gonna build uh, uh, this based on a microscope world I had several players that I have played with for 30 years who were like oh I don't know I don't know about that um, and they were terrified um, and I asked them what what they were bothered by and it was that they even though they knew everybody else at the table that they kind of didn't trust that maybe they would get that that they would break the game in some way that they they would they would 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 screw it up um, and, and people that, that know each other for years so that is uh, a big hurdle and and inherently there is just a thing that collaboration does require sharing power so there's always that difficulty with it. I want to welcome um, McGay Baker, who just joined us, and I'm so glad that you did. Um, she's the author of Valiant Girls of a Thousand and One Nights, a game of enticing stories, and um, and, and Siron. And uh, I wanted to speak to you. We started out by talking a little bit about collaboration in the games that you've worked on. So mm -hmm. can we hear a little bit about your experience with collaboration in games, McGay. Sure, and my apologies for being late. I had uh, car trouble and 12 different things. So, um, are you more interested in the process of design or in play? I love both, so okay. why, don't you, <laughs> why don't you speak to us on design first, okay. and we can come back around to play. That's definitely part of it. Sure. Um, in the games that I've written, the game, the world design is very much my own, and because I'm very much in a mind that uh, players design the game that they want at the table, I don't have a lot of world building in there in terms of you know cultures or setting. Um, what I want is something that's evocative and something that's exciting and something that people can hook into in different ways in their own creative uh, processes engage. Um, with Thousand and One Nights, that's probably the most uh, world-building, flavorish, flavor-heavy <laughs> of the games because it was so informed by my experience of reading the Tales of the Arabian Nights as a child and the illustrations of H.J. Ford and the, uh, Andrew Lang's fairy books and all of that. So there's a very rich world to draw from in that. But as I say in the introduction to that book, I have not set that game in any real Arabic place or time. I haven't addressed. There's tons of things I haven't addressed literature, music, religion, all these things, that if I was doing a more robust world building, I may have gone into all of those different avenues, but I really wanted to leave that for the imagination and creative impulse of the player. So that's where that one sits. Uh, the other ones, Siren is, you, know, you have superpowers and amnesia, go. You know. <laughs> um, that's, that's pretty straight up. Um, Valiant Girls comes directly out of my experience working in Ethiopia. And the I wanted to, again, be very light. And because Valiant Girls is a nano game, it's only 512 words long. Um, I wanted to be very light on anything that could be interpreted as... Um, well, it really is like my Western white American point of view saying this is what Ethiopia is like because I was only there for 10 days. Um, and by saying, you are an Ethiopian girl, all the all player characters, you are an Ethiopian girl. Now you are strong, resourceful, and loved. Now is your time of action. Go. You know? <laughs> Um, I really, I think there's, you know, that's the balancing act, right? With world building, either 
make it so rich and so detailed that there's an answer for everything or make it open-ended and evocative with enough creative boundaries that people can fill in those details themselves. And that is really about the idea, I think that that basic idea of RPG and improvisation and collaborative improvisation. That it's all of you at the table telling that story. Exactly. You begin with. So we had talked a little bit about mechanics and how they aid with collaboration. So that was where we had just come around when you popped up. So glad to see you. So do you have something to say about like what mechanics aid that collaboration? Essentially the, the ideas of playing or collaborating fairly or safely. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, one of the things that's very interesting as a designer is looking at the, the ways in which you can use your mechanics to structure the conversation. Uh, I can use my mechanics to ask you questions, to say, what are you interested in? What are you curious about? Tell me, tell me all the little details. Uh, I can use my mechanics to get you to barf forth apocalyptic craziness. Um, I can use mechanics to make you tell truly horrific ghost stories um, in Murderous Ghosts. It's amazing how many people go, I got killed in the first 20... Yes. It's the game is called Murderous Ghosts. Um, so that choice, you're making a choice in your mechanics of how you, what's the question you're asking. Um, as a designer, that's one of the things I look at um, in finding the fit of the correct mechanics for the game I'm working on is what are the questions I'm asking and how do these mechanics support those sorts of questions and what sort of information am I eliciting from my players um, by using these mechanics. Um, so I don't know if there's a, a one right answer in terms of how to how to best design mechanics for uh, collaborative world building, but definitely it's something to keep in mind. I'm really looking forward to going back and watching the other the first um, <laughs> 20 minutes of this that I missed. <laughs> we talked about you the whole time. It was great. Yeah. Oh no, <laughs> no. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we keep saying the question and answers and. And I think that that's an important sort of definition here is one of the things that, that collaboration and, and shared approaches do is they change up the usual state of who gets to ask the questions and who gets to answer those questions and, and that process of, of answering those uh, changes up uh, in, in games like this. You know, that we have a, a level of game where there's sort of the, the pre-world building, but then there are sets of games that in play are about a GM list often uh, one player posing a question to another or putting an obstacle in front of another and that process being being collaborative and, and shared and very different from the usual I mean it's distributed power in 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 that approach yeah and I think one thing uh, we talked about this a little bit before but uh, I think when Sherry you brought up the point of people saying that uh, often when they visualize these games collaborative games they think oh well anybody can just say anything uh, which is which is Definitely a sign that they have not played these games. Uh, that a lot of them very much try to point towards the situation where we're really kind of going head to head with a I've got a vision and you've got a vision and we're we're uh, on this accelerated not exactly collision course but but we're we really are trying to see um, uh, what is going to come out of these these conflicting. Uh, visions, and that's really—I mean—that's where the rules come in. The rules come in to say, like, well, when we do not agree, when we have different ideas about these things, um, how do we resolve that? Um, and it's—I have never sat down at one of these games and had it feel like, kind of like, oh, well, we're just kind of all casually telling stories without really concern. It's almost always people are leaning in, like, I've got an idea, and other people mm. are like poker face, like, hmm, okay, well, sure, but. Um, it can be a very, uh, I don't want to say tense affair, but in a good way, in a good, in a good, very engaged, um, very leaning in kind of way. I think intense is fair. I think that's very fair. I mean, one of the I most, don't want to scare uh, people off. <laughs> well, no, like Emily Care Boss uh, and I have played games together for close to 20 years, and one of the most highly conflicted, difficult sessions we've ever played uh, 
came about because we disagreed on the map. You know, her, it was she and Vincent and I, and we were doing a thing. It was the beginning of a 10 year long Ars Magica, turned out to be 10 year long Ars Magica campaign. And I'm like, okay, and the map is like this, and there's a thing and a road, and, a, and I, I love maps. Oh my God. And I said, no, this has to be over here. And we, it totally broke down for like an hour. It was crazy because that part, what you're talking, you know, what Ben is talking about there is the way where our uh, creative vision has to mesh. You know, there has to be a, a, a way that we structure incorporating each other's creative voice. And it, when they collide, that can be really problematic. So having rules and having mechanic support uh, for who, how, how different bits of uh, the world are owned or developed um, can be really, really helpful. And otherwise, it does get difficult. Like the, the map example you give, sometimes things that seem trivial, like, oh, it's trivial, that's not important. It, it isn't necessarily trivial. The person involved might have a complicated reason why they want things to be the way they are. And you can't always see that. You're sitting across from them and going like, I don't get the big deal. Why does why, do, why does their cloak have to be red? And the person's like, no. Because it's red. And, and they're not going to tell you. In their head, they're like, I've got a really good reason. And they're hung up on it. And, and you're trying to gauge like, uh, how serious are you about this red cloak? I don't understand. Mm. Like in, um, in Microscope, I have this really kind of minimal... It's, it's almost like a when in doubt break glass, the finger voting thing, which is kind of silly in a way if you stop and think about it. And yet when you start doing it, it's a way to kind of say, well, tell me how much you care about the red cloak. Um, it's kind of, it's just a, it's a way to kind of let people be clearly very enthusiastic about something. Um, it's not a great mechanic overall, but I think for, for it, it exemplifies that exact problem. We really aren't mind readers. We really mm -hmm. don't know why people are saying the stuff they're saying. And we have to sometimes really remember that we're not mind readers and go, maybe they have a really good reason to be saying this. Maybe they're really hung up on this idea. And that's a, that's a real shift, uh, I will say, uh, coming out of, of some things that John Wick says in Blood and Honor, which is another great Japanese RPG that has a collaborative the group gets together and they build you know a clan and they decide on what's valuable to them and that's another a sort of collaborative character process that's that I, that makes that game really striking but he has some GM advice in there that I've really taken to heart is that if you have a story a backstory a motivation an idea for your character yes a dark secret whatever you don't keep it to yourself. It's not between you and the GM. The only way that the other players can interact and play off and work with it is if you if you share it, if you are collaborative about that, if you bring that out to them. And I, I, that's changed the way we played in the last five years. That that I make people talk about that, and and re, and they respect each other. Whoops. Uh, and. Uh, uh, it, it makes it a more solid game. Uh, people are having more fun because they're not. I mean, we we were talking to a friend who was playing a game, and uh, essentially what it was is they thought another player was an asshole because they didn't know what the backstory was. And when it finally kind of came out, it was that that person was playing their backstory, but no one else could see it. So all they got was, "Wow, you're a jerk." Um, and at times. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I think it's a, one of the things that if the mechanic of fate with the compels and with you having to have your aspects out there that everyone in the group knows them, that they know the buttons to push on you. So that that's a mechanic that sort of was really a eureka for me to go, oh gosh, as a player, if I want to play these, these flaws, having them out there is the best thing ever. Ever, but you know, you you're taught when you start playing, it's you play it competitively, and you're like, I got this cool backstory, and I'm gonna win because I have this cool backstory, so no one knows it. So, <laughs> but exactly, exactly. And, and I think, yeah. So, and in these mechanics, there's always that sort of difference of of the difference between the player who is expressing all of their story who has the voice, who has that certainty, and then the other people who aren't, haven't learned those skills. 
So I think in some ways with collaboration, another thing that you're doing is trying to find mechanics that bring that quiet player or that reserve player forward. Agreed, I, agreed. Yeah. Now what are some mechanics that you've seen that help do that? I mean, I think the well, fate compels and aspects are good, for instance. I I really structured who says what first in Siren in partly to address that to make it not always the same person who answers. Because I think, because of the history of role-playing games, it's very easy to break into the player-GM dyad. And it's easy, if you're going to step into the GM position, you're a person who doesn't mind talking. That's just how it goes. Otherwise, you know, you're going to learn fast. There's a fast learning curve on that. <laughs> um, but by putting uh, decision-making, like, for certain situations in the mechanics of Siren, so that other people have to talk first. Um, that was part of that, uh, the design goal there is to get other people's creative input, both to engage them to move them back again when they're not the person who's necessarily on screen, to so to say, but uh, to give people who may be more reticent or quiet or reserved by nature a, a little spotlight moment. Now is your now is your time. Um, anything that has spotlights, anything that that pulls from uh, prime time adventures and has that idea of now is your time uh, is going to support that sort of culture where everybody gets their turn. And I think there's something to be said for challenge. Uh, Mechanics, for instance, Brad, I saw you had posted something about thinking about ways for using aspects so that they couldn't use the same lame aspect over and over again for things, and and that was sort of a, a strange thing where I was going, you know, and all the fake games are played, I've never seen that, and yet I too have this great fear that that's going to occur. But I like the thinking about that. What are some of the things that you know when you're thinking about bringing people into that game, and you know? where you're going, okay, challenge is part of that as well. Sure. Well, when we started writing Diaspora, we'd only played Spirit of the Century twice. <laughs> we played Burning Wheel a couple of times. So we were still really very much in a early traveler and D&D mindset that opened all these ideas. So uh, there was a lot of old school gameplay stuck at our table that we were trying to uh, wedge into the new rules. And so we did see a lot of using the same aspect over and over again, just because the players weren't used to exerting that level of creativity and authority over the scene that they had with the rules. Uh, and so those kind of rules wound up in Diaspora, like simply you can't use the same aspect twice in a row, uh, or the whole scope system for, uh, for aspects. So you can't just pile on all the aspects you have and make up some ridiculous story why they all might fit together. Uh, because the, I guess, not really a lack of trust, but a lack of uh, individual confidence in the at the table about what the difference between the rules and the narrative was, uh, led to those kinds of, not really abuses, but just, there were bits of play that weren't fun, and so we just mechanized ways around them. And if we sat down and played today, we probably wouldn't need those rules. Um, but so we were our own neophytes in that sense. Uh, and we had to teach ourselves how to play effectively with those rules. I think I think that's a good a good thing about practicing collaboration or practicing any new system that's teaching you a different way to share or contribute. Um, ben, Ben, what are some of the things when you've seen people playing Microscope for the first time that have been sort of hurdles for them? Uh, I have seen people very uncomfortable. <laughs> um, playing Microscope for the first time. And in fact, I mean, you could say that the core, one of the very core design uh, elements of Microscope is exactly that idea of getting uh, quiet people to talk. And not only quiet people who are quiet by choice, but people who, um, and this gets into a lot of like social equality stuff and people at the table, um, uh, sp uh, specifically women at the table in gaming communities who a lot of times don't feel like they have the ability, or not the ability, it's not the right word. They feel like they're not... Um, heard as equally and this is like a raw brute force approach to saying guess what now at this point one person is going to be talking um, we've had games where we have literally sat quietly for minutes waiting for somebody to go ahead uh, and they were in a 
I have to say, uncomfortable position. Um, people I gamed with for, in fact, this is with my old like D and D-ish group. Uh, people who I knew would not be comfortable doing this, and the amazing part was, once they got over it, and once they actually introduced something to see an idea that they had put in that they didn't think was that good, and they finally coughed it up, like, okay, here's this thing that happens. And then we were all like, well, that's really a great idea. And we started to build on it around the loop. And then by the time it came all the way around, that had become like the centerpiece of our game. And not because we were like, oh, let's make him happy. That wasn't it at all. <laughs> it was a, it, it, this, is, this is the robbery. This is the crime. People you've gamed with for 20 years, but you've never really gotten the truth out of them. They have, they have, they have never really... Some, so we had an extra participant. Uh, Bring them in. <laughs> <laughs> no, but so pe people you've been with for twenty years who have never, who have never uh, really been been honest with you about their ideas. They've been hiding them. You know, they've been kind of hiding their light under a bushel. And then you finally get them to say something creative in this zone where it's just them. They have to talk. They're in the total spotlight, and they say these things that just blow your mind. And you're like. Dude, you you were ripping me off for the last twenty years by not sharing these great ideas with me, and it's fantastic, and it's just this amazing thing. And then they walk away, kind of going, "Oh, okay, I kind of maybe I'm a little more awesome than I thought I was." And that's for me, that is just it's such a great part of the game. It's such a it's such a uh, it can be it can be painful. It can be a little bit hot seatish, but the payoff is uh, it's pretty magnificent to behold. I have to say. I would. <laughs> Oops. <sorry. laughs> That was a really big payoff for us with Universalis because it, I mean, it was one of the first games we played that had any kind of shared authority. Mm -hmm. And because it literally quantifies how much you care about something, mm -hmm. we discovered some amazing things about people that we'd already gamed with for 20 years because they were just willing to keep dumping coins on this idea that they had that I would never have dreamed they would care about. It. And then what <laughs> counter it equally because they cared so much that it didn't happen. Uh, it was really eye-opening, and I think that really got us all into the groove of speaking up, uh, about you know giving up whatever idea it is that we have. It really broke the ice for us. Well, and it, it there's a there's a second level in that. It also encourages a set of respect for the people who are often the the loudest and most vociferous at the table that they have to kind of pause and listen and they'll usually bring that in but I will admit that at our table whenever we do microscope or a thing like that we have to have tons of snacks uh, <laughs> because when someone like Sherry goes to Kibitz uh, you know or 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 go oh wait 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 uh, I you have to point to the snacks and, and that's the only way to keep people tied up is is to, to make them eat uh, nervously while they're waiting uh, for the other person to go. There's That's a, a good technique rule. here. There's a technique here. Um, it's the step up, step back technique um, to encourage people who are you know, to recognize when you are talking a lot and to it, to put a, like, oh, I'm going to step back. Uh, and it's it, it follows off something someone just said. Um, reminded me of this before, like how we, when we put names to things, um, it helps them come into the public mind. So, like if you're saying everybody contribute, this is a game where everybody contributes. That's going to be more on someone's mind. If if, if you know playing microscope, and you you know that there's going to be a turn that's your turn to say something, maybe that creates some awkwardness. But it's also you're, you it, you know it's going to happen. And if you have some technique uh, where you can recognize, oh, I'm going to step back for a bit, even saying that as someone like myself who likes to talk a lot and be like font of detailed ideas all the time, it's very helpful to say, oh, I'm, I'm going to step back for a bit because then I've said it and you've all heard it and then I can do it more easily. And this, and the same goes with um, when I ask someone else to step forward and I can turn to them in the group and say, you know, you know and, and say, Brad, you haven't, what, do you, what do you think about you know, the price of tea in China? And um, <laughs> Brad might have an idea. Um, so having that, I, the snacks is a big thing. <laughs> Giving, I, I, you know, I agree with the snacks. But also recognizing that space um, and creating uh, mechanisms, even if it's just within your own group, 
because one of the things that that I did want to get back to that Ben had brought up is that that anxiety that people have when they're asked to um, come up with ideas uh, and they feel on the spot and then they feel you know we've all had this we're come up with a fantastic name for a wizard right now right everybody's like oh, oh. <laughs> yeah names names because <laughs> what happens yeah <laughs> what happens is that thing that Ben said where you know, people second guess themselves constantly. And one of the things I'm really interested in in game design and also just in people is that everybody's story is interesting. You know, ev everyone has stories worth listening to, worth hearing. Everyone has stories worth telling because people are really cool and bizarre and fascinating to me and characters even more so so having a place where people have to come up with something on the fly finding ways to make that less intimidating is really important for me um, and one of the reasons in uh, Thousand One Nights I point everybody to nursery rhymes and say build on that you know, what's, what's the first nursery rhyme that comes into your head and what are you know think of how you could tweak that and then tell one of those stories because you, you, everybody knows millions of stories. We just think that we have to come up with something brand new, totally original, totally different, so it's no one ever heard of. So not true. So that is a bunch of talking. I'm gonna be quiet again. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting because one of the mechanisms that we have in in several of the prototypes for Soft Horizon, which is nowhere near ready yet. Um, Damn. It uses a diaspora sort of cluster system, but each, each of the planes that's developed in this kind of multiverse, magical, uh, heavy metal fantasy milieu has an element. And the planes element defines how magic uh, expresses there. So if the element is stone, then magic is always about stone and earth and things like that. And when you're, when you're doing the world, world building collaboratively, when your turn is up and you're trying to describe what's interesting about this plane, how to make sense of the statistics and so on, the element is actually a really valuable uh, anchor to, to grab onto and develop ideas about culture and interaction and so on. So what we've done is we've just got nouns on the bottom of every page in the book. So there's 200 nouns, electricity, spirit, uh, excitement, all these, all these kinds of things. So if you are stuck, you can just kind of surf the book quickly, and hopefully you get an anchor that just grabs you and you run with that. And we find that's that a, pretty nice instant. That's way cool. That's a really good idea. I would say that um, a lot of times when I see people react to collaboration, they're worried about the guy who takes over. But in fact, mm. the thing that, that you see as much or more is the person who shuts down and really really beats themselves up on it um, so that's kind of crazy <laughs> that that essentially our mind is always worried about the one who's going to take over uh, inherently collaborations about power right it's about Actually, giving it up sharing it in some ways oh sorry um, yeah Ben I was gonna say that um, I think one thing that we're, we're kind of hitting on but is really important to point out is that the the bad collaboration the part where the people speak over other people or where they won't wait for people to finish or, or the person sitting quietly and they kind of jump in with ideas, it's often out of the best intentions. If, you, if you're across the table from someone and they look stumped or they look anxious, it's a very human and sympathetic tendency to want to say, oh, well, let me give you an idea. You don't have to be, you know, you say, oh, don't be miserable. You know, like, you can't come up with a name for the wizard. Here's a name for the wizard. I got ten. Here you go. <laughs> that you're not necessarily just being a selfish jerk. You're, you're often going like, oh, this is now socially awkward. This person is upset. I will jump in and save the day with my awesomeness. And then before you know it, it's just you saving the day all the time and no one's getting to go. And, and you never know which it is. It's like, well, if I give them two more seconds, do they have an idea? And sometimes you'll, in a game you'll say that, you'll say, like, are you thinking of something or are you totally stumped? You'll ask them flat out, like, how's it going over there? You know, what's what's going on? Um, mm -hmm. But it, it's just that idea that, that it's funny that it's not about people being bad people. It's often our best intentions, which, exactly. which make these situations Great not point. work. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, and that often the things that cause this sort of crazy thing is, is people trying to help each other out. 
exactly. you know, and and that's that's it. It's not that we're all walking around uh, having to be worried about the evil person that somehow shown up at our game table for the first time. <laughs> <ever>. It's, <laughs> but, but um, well, I guess one of the things that I'm always interested in is is when you're you're doing these things and you're introducing them to people. Uh, what are some ways that you sort of, I guess, you've got your mechanics, you've got those things, but for you to be a good collaborator, what are the things that you really th need to keep in mind? Listen to each other. <laughs> so hesitant. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> no, I just, you know, I want to leave that three beats of space for someone else to talk. Yeah. <laughs> And also, it's like very basic, you know. Yeah. Listen to each other. Well, and and uh, uh, the 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 improv rule about not negating. Mm. I mean, it's 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 in, implicit in most of the the collaboration systems and and rules. Um, but it's something to keep in mind uh, is that that you don't negate. You you do try and build, and you're you're better off building on something that somebody else has has done and that, that there's a pleasure to that, I think. I think there's also something there's also something to be said for the idea that um uh uh John Harper once said to me, you know what, no two games are like you can't you can't look at one game and say, because I played this other game this way, I should play this game this way. It's sometimes very valuable to stop and say but in this particular game, the procedures are this, and they're this way for a reason. And they might directly contradict procedures you've played in another game, but there's a reason for that. Hopefully. Hopefully there's a reason for that. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you have to say, M maybe in this game I behave very differently. Like in Microscope, you have the poker face kind of idea. You don't give away secrets. or you're not, not, don't, It's not that you don't give away secrets, but you don't kind of just openly say, oh, let's go this way. But in another game, that would be exactly the right thing to do. So you've right. got to kind of know, know where you're at. Right. I agree. Another thing I like, just as a social tactic, is if somebody is is having trouble, or if they're if they're in the process of elaborating something, but they're obviously hesitant, is just ask for more detail. If you find something that you think is interesting, ask them. Just being asked to talk more is flattering, intrinsically, right? That's going to bring people mm -hmm. in. Um, but it also demands that they focus on something that they now know somebody else wants to hear about. It. That brings people to the table. Following that, I like asking people for more details on things that they didn't introduce. Uh, you know, if you know, if we're playing and Sherry has introduced this village, and there's a blacksmith and you know, a garden or whatever, and I want to know more about the blacksmith, I won't necessarily ask Sherry. And say so. You know, so Brad, what's the black, does the blacksmith have a family? What's that like? Because this uh, contributes to the collaborative uh, world. You know, so long as I'm not stepping on on Sherry's contribution, um, because that's that's important too. But when I'm with that details thing that Brad that you just mentioned, to to have the details coming from all kinds of people, all the details. Uh, about all kinds of things. And that also allows for a division of space in terms of like sort of the ownership element of collaboration where there's a lot of collaboration and there's a lot of collaborative world building, but sooner or later there's going to be some person who emerges as the one who really cares, the one who's put a lot of points down to use the universalis uh, model on something being like this and they just really are invested in how that thing is that's okay sometimes that means we turn that bit over as a group say all right you are in charge of the library you're wicked interested and you know all the details great you're just the library person will ask um, i think that's those, those keeping those two things in balance you know where you're asking everybody for details and where you're recognizing who has any who has become invested in an in aspect of your collaborative world there's some good points there. I think, especially that one of the things in collaboration that you're always working with are people's ability or ways that they have to communicate how important something is, or you know, for you to communicate to them how closely you're listening to them. Um, and so, what is you know, that's the thing is, is you've got like kingdom going on there. How does that? Yeah. 
how is how is that working with those ideas because I, I notice it is really about building up the conflicts and the obstacles that, that an organization has to face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kingdom Kingdom is a little, it's quite different than Microscope. Um, it's one of the core ideas of the game is that uh, you're all part of this organization together, whatever the organization happens to be. And so even if you do not have initial conflicts amongst yourselves, because you all care so much about this central thing. In a way, you could say that the kingdom becomes a metaphor for the game. Mm -hmm. uh, you're all involved, you're all participating, you all have different ways to influence uh, where it goes. And when I say different ways to influence it, there's, there's specific roles that have um, almost totally different rule systems they're following for how they can influence what's happening. Um, some indirect, uh, some very direct. Uh, some kind of determining what the consequences of our actions will be, some kind of determining uh, what the people, the other people of our community want. Uh, but the point is that you're, you're all kind of initially kind of like, yeah, we all kind of agree, and then slowly you start to see that you're not as parallel lines as you thought you were, and so you're not actually antagonistic towards each other necessarily, but you see this fascinating thing where people slowly begin to kind of disagree with each other. Uh, and at the game table, it's very kind of pleasant to watch people. Instead of being like, okay, we're head-to-head, -head, we're antagonistic, um, it's this dawning realization that you're you're not all going to get what you want and that you're kind of like, you'll have these little discussions where you realize you're branching um, kind of apart in your objectives. And then before long, people will get like, no, I'm seriously going to storm the castle to prevent this thing from happening. I am now, I am all in on I'm this. I am going rogue. <laughs> I am going rogue. And you'll see people, and other people will be looking at them going, you're going to go rogue, aren't you? And there's even a thing where you can basically kind of poke people to be like, I dare you to go rogue. I'm yeah, like, you yeah. know, bring it. Let's see what you got. Um, and it's fun because you do have these mechanics that allow you to draw out other players and to say, like, well, I don't really know quite what you're about, so I'm going to keep just throwing these things in your direction and see how you react to them. Um, yeah, it's super fun. I'm enjoying it, enjoying it quite a bit. Well, and here's the thing is, is that collaborative games really allow your games to take a little bit more risk and get to some of those those ideas about um, conflict, and especially conflict of interest, a little bit more right. than you could mm -hmm. with something that just comes from outside and they tell you this is how this world works. Go, well, no, you know, and it's yeah. You, if you there's don't a, understand what's important to you, you can't have a conflict about it. Right. It's and there's two. There's there's a thing that I think that I feel that we as as game designers don't aren't explicit enough about, and that's a. I mean, it's there. We all know it, but we don't. I don't think we have like little symbols for it. It's the when I'm making this decision, am I making a decision, kind of as my character or as this neutral world person? You know, is this when I when I'm framing a scene in a game, my character isn't framing a scene. I, the player, am framing framing a scene, and I might be framing a scene in which something has just happened to my character. Um, so you've got these these different hats you're putting on, and there's two hats, and you're changing them very rapidly. And as experienced players, experienced gamers, we don't really notice it, or we don't. We just do it kind of without really thinking about it. But an inexperienced person will often stop dead and say, "Wait, I'm only making decisions my character makes, right? That they haven't they haven't recognized that 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 sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't." And jumping back and forth between those two uh, is kind of a constant process. I mean, that's that's kind of the fundamental conflict. Um, that you see with uh, when we we're talking before about um, aspects and some data being secret, and we've all kind of agreed that no, it's better if it's all up front. Part of that's because we have a rigid division between player and character in our heads. The fact that I know something doesn't mean my character knows it. The fact that I compelled you on this topic doesn't mean my character knows you're like that. It means your character is like that, and I, the player, am calling you out to, to act on, on that. Uh, on that aspect, and yeah, I mean, I have run into players who just don't have that division. They're always in character mode all the time, and uh, again, that's another thing I wish I could go back and call out explicitly in the diaspora and say, look, you know, sometimes you're the player and sometimes you're the character, and it's important which one you are. And that kind of, I mean, that highlights, I mean, really the whole idea of, the whole idea of this panel of saying, like, well, how can you collaboratively make a world and then play in it? How can you switch from, like, a collaborative corporation to a GMing? That's the entire question. How can I simultaneously participate in world building and then go play in that world and be comfortable doing that? And I think a lot of people who are used to a model in which the GM has come to the table with the world of mystery 
it will ruin it for them sometimes. They'll say, no, now that I know the secrets, I can't, I can't enjoy myself because they're not comfortable recognizing that having that, knowing the secrets permits them to participate in the game in an informed and joyous fashion because they get the jokes. You know, they, they understand why it's ironic what's happening or why what they're doing is tragic, even right. if their characters don't. They haven't, they haven't made that, that leap. I would really recommend, like, for, uh, Ars Magica was such a, a big shift in that, both introduce, in, introducing lots of things, introducing uh, troop-style play, where you're playing more than one character, introducing co uh, concepts of co-GM, which points straight at you know, what Ben was just saying, and how we create a, a collaborative world, and then to let also play in that world. I think it is a skill. I think you're right. I think there are there are definitely people who don't don't either have haven't cultivated that skill or don't care. Like football is a skill, but I sure have not cultivated football in myself. You know, <laughs> I am so not. It's it's totally okay <laughs> um, to have there be things out there where you're like, yeah, I'm not gonna do that because um, I'm doing other stuff that's totally fun. But that aspect of Figuring out how to firewall for yourself is really useful, and you can do a lot of cool things with that if you figure like, okay, we're going to set up a real, this, this is going to be really cool, we're going to do all this stuff, and it's going to be really neat, and then we're going to run our characters through that, and it's going to be awesome, and we're going to just laugh at their misery all the time. <laughs> um, that's so much fun, but you have to be able to have that um, firewalling. Yeah. Where you know things as a person that your character doesn't, and that that's okay. Well, and and uh, and I'm going to kind of actually uh, pull in one of the questions that's on the um, uh, the comments, and I have a couple mm -hmm. others from there. But one of the, the questions is, that's asked there is, uh, uh, how do we sell these kinds of techniques to collaborative world building to traditional gamers? And uh, I'll come at it. Uh, at least from from my point of view, from more conventional GM, where we've used microscope, where we've used that to do world building, um, I think GMs kind of are worried that then they don't have control, or then they can't you know do anything. My experience is, you get a, a great session, the players get together, they they build the world, and then they're excited to play in it. They have buy-in. They have ownership. Yeah. And it's not like they get vetoes or something. After that, you can play your traditional classic 3.5 game or Pathfinder or whatever, and the players are, are delighted because as a GM, now you've got all this material and you're able to bring it to the table. You know, somebody put unicorns in, so the unicorns <laughs> turned out to be the Illuminati, and they're shocked. You know, awesome. they, put, they, put, they put it in the, the game, and when it came back, and that was the big reveal at the end of the campaign, they were freaking out. Um, you know, or the person who just decided that everybody was born twins, and we made oh, that into a a massive part of the world that, that had to do with the way that the, the world had been shattered and the split souls and so on, and it was just a little thing, and they got to see that get built up not only in that play session of the, the actual world building, but then in the course of the campaign, that's become huge. And if you're as a GM, you're kind of paying attention and you know who, who's done things, you can go, okay, here's some stuff that Scott put in there. I really want to make sure I bring that out. Or here's some things that Sherry put in there. I'm going to bring those out. And players are ultimately more engaged, more involved, um, more excited about the world. And here's the other thing, they haven't had to read the Pathfinder Gazetteer. They haven't had to read the <laughs> Forgotten Realms book. They haven't had to watch all of the Star Wars films and things like that. They have authority, they have ownership, and they have competency in the world because they are just as smart about the world as you are. And yet as a GM, you're still able to surprise them. Um, and if I were going to say that at least selling microscope to players, that's what I do and the, the world building thing. But the, the larger question is how you share ideas, how you sell sharing collaboration to, to, to players. Uh, and that's the, the question that was posed that I just went on about. <laughs> I'm going to say too, for people that love verisimilitude and want, want to maximize that and who, are, who might be resistant to this kind of thing, what you get for free out of this is characters that know things about the world that they should know. Right. Uh, if you've ever been in a D&D &D game 
and you're playing a character who's lived in a city where they've lived all their life, and yet the player somehow feels they have to ask the referee if there's a magic shop down the road. Right? They've been there their whole life. They should know that. And whether or not that detail comes out during the world building, so everybody knows that, or whether it comes a little bit more subtly because having built that chunk of the world, the player feels they have a little bit more authority to just say, I'll go to the magic shop that's two blocks down the road from here. And the referee is used to releasing a little bit of authority because the player participated in building that world. You know, this doesn't have to be a formal uh, rule-based structure to allow this kind of thing to happen. I think naturally people grab onto ownership of what they build. And uh, it makes the place feel more real in a lot of ways. Yeah. Well, and I'll say uh, to to kind of can keep talking. Uh, uh, sorry, the trick, <laughs> the, the, the trick that we do that I have done is whenever someone says to me, "Is there a chandelier, or is there a rope, or is that a table?" I go, "I'm sorry, what did you say?" And I will keep doing that until they go, "Oh, there's a rope." <laughs> or there's a chandelier. And I will tell you. It, that's and I do that to everybody, and they've they've all learned that, and now they're all willing to say, okay, there's a there's a table, it's filled with with silver. I'm going to slide down it and send everything flying, or they'll they'll add those bits. They know, sort of that they can do that. Mm -hmm. But you got to you got to be honest though, which is that there is kind of like we talked about at the beginning. There is an invisible line. If they say. Yeah. Oh, I'm gonna to go to that cult that I know is here that totally worships that god that I'm all about. And you might be like, oh no, that's too much. That's it, there. There is this very subtle social agreement about how much is any particular game master allowing you to kind of bring in things on the fly. And at what point will they go? Oh no, no, no. That's that's you're you're, you're doing too much. You've stepped on it. I have a plan for that guild. You can't make that up. And that's. Uh, I think that can be that can be pretty tricky. A again, if you're playing with a group of people you know very well not as much of a problem because you, you, you all know each other, you know your your likes and dislikes or you know kind of, um, you have a better sense of what that individual GM is going to allow. Um, but there's a lot going on subtly there that that uh, is it's inobvious, I would say. I just like to say yes, yes yeah. instead, like when yeah. in, in, in a situation like, 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 um, like Lowell just brought up, where someone says, is there a chandelier? Yeah, there's a chandelier here, and it's kind of has many branches like this go on. You know, so that it's, I'm inviting in their contribution. It protects that line that Ben just really beautifully um, described, and I'm building on what they're contributing. And it allows me to be able to say, no, there isn't a chandelier here. Because reasons. Because reasons. <laughs> We're in a yeah. warehouse. There's no chandelier in the warehouse. There's no chandelier. <laughs> yeah. Although it'd be creepy and cool if there was. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Warehouse well, yeah. chandelier. Well, actually, that's an interesting point. I think in one thing is 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 that Lowell and I. One of our conversations that we had when we were talking about doing the collaborative world building was because we had some new players, and he was going, "Well, what kind of genres would you know they be familiar with?" And I'm like. I, you know, that's a good question. I'm not familiar with most of the genres you try to play in, and I'm faking it all along. <laughs> and <laughs> in some ways, I've found that the collaborative world building actually helps for defining genre for people mm -hmm. who aren't familiar with it. This is particularly a problem for me because for me, for instance, there was no such thing as a pulp genre until I was introduced to it. I had no idea this was a genre. Um, I certainly hadn't read like great scads of it or been a student of it and so it was completely useless for to me that something was described that way. Um, and so once we started doing collaborative, all of a sudden I could start to recognize the elements and when we could add new things to it, understood what was different or what I could get a hold on there. But just that whole discussion was helpful. I think uh, there are other ways that this can inform people, but when you bring new players in, collaborative can bring, what do you say, that expertise that's so important. Um, well, it can also be a space where the new person can bring a new point of view into the collaboration and like, oh, here's what we've got. What do you got? And they can say, oh, well, there's this, there's this uh, bunch of ferry boat folks and they have this traveling ferry boat market and wow, you know, there's a whole piece of your world that you didn't know about before and they brought it with them and then everybody's invested and they're invested and it's great. 
Brad, mm-hmm. you, 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 I kind of, I kind of, there was something you were going to say. Uh, oh, I've forgotten what it was, but I got something else. <laughs> <laughs> you look um, like you might have something. Else. But it was awesome. <laughs> I'm sure it was, it was much better than what I have now. Um, one thing that I have noticed is even in a really quite carefully prescribed genre as we have in Diaspora, uh, which is almost a setting before you sit down to, uh, to do the world building, Still, every time I play with people I haven't played with before, I discover what they think hard science fiction is. <laughs> an enormous continuum of space uh, to, to discover new things and discover people's expectations. So it, even in that tight, tight space, there still seems to be very little constraint. And that discovery is pretty exciting for me as a GM, since I'm almost always GMing. Um, to, to, to run with whatever it is that they've got, to, to basically yes and or yes but everything that they've got and try to try to craft something that meets their expectations. Well, I think that uh, yeah, I think I mean genre genre is kind of a myth. It's a we, we if I say Wild West, we think we all know what we're talking about. But in fact we probably have, you know, there's what, six of us, five of us, others oh, five of us, five different viewpoints in our head of what that means. Uh, but as we play, we then create what we mean by it, and it's probably then some unique thing. It's almost like it's like even with like a character, you start off with some kind of stereotype of your character, but as you play, you make them into a person. Same is true with the world. Same is true with any kind of setting. Um, you define what you guys mean by pulp, and, not, and another person walking in would say that's not pulp at all. Like, well, for us it is, that's, and it doesn't even matter that it's pulp anymore. That, that, that's, that word is irrelevant. It is your setting at that point, and that, and that gets back to the entire process we're talking about. It the you make you make it your own. You make this unique thing that you are all then PhD experts on, um, and you can and you can then play as just as, as you guys were saying before with uh, consonants and. and uh, Certain amount, certain amount of the land now because now you're, you're an expert on the world that you live in, as you should be. One of the other questions that's uh, posted on the, the forum is uh, what other games would you guys mention or suggest as, as games that are inviting to collaboration uh, and, and the kind of shared, shared power games? Um, that you've experienced. I, I know, uh, Miguel, you mentioned Primetime Adventures. Yep. I'd also mention Shock. Um, shock, Shock. Yeah. Uh, shock. Universalis. Um, I mean, those are the Primetime Adventures, Shock, Universalis. Jeez, basically the entire indie, independent published library. You know, <laughs> it's, if, it's, if, it's on, if it's on the Unstore, uh, you probably have some element of collaborative world uh, building there. Um, so all of my games, Vincent's games, uh, Steal Away Jordan has great collaborative elements. Um, by Julie von Illingbo. Uh, Emily Care Boss's games uh, have all kinds of anyway, I could just I could just start same, you know, just lot, just lots of them, lots of them. Any new ones that are particularly exciting or different or interesting? I know Sunderland. anyone. Sunderland, okay. Sunderland, which, which um, does the way uh, the fascinating things. If you look, it's hashtag doomed pilgrim. Um, <laughs> uh, that's the the online. Played on G plus. Uh, the way that this is collaborative world building is that you have one in in, in the ones that are uh, played by G plus. And I just wrote a post on this um, where you have one person who's playing the player, and the entire world out there is playing the world, the GM, everything. Um, it's the most like straight up collaborative. I'm actually running a, a Cyrum the Pursuit. Uh, game for Contessa concurrent with this, although my day has been... I'm, anyway, where I'm inviting collaboration in a very immediate and direct and ongoing way, and both of these games do that. Uh, the Sunderland games... Um, yeah, there's there's tons of collaboration. Vast and Starlet by Epidiah Ravishal, tons of collaboration. Whole thing fits on a business card. All you do is collaborate. All that's on the business card is the structure, like we've been talking about through this um, last hour, uh, 
the ways to structure that collaborated input. That's what's on the card. The rest of it, you just you just go. It's awesome, and, and I highly recommend it. Okay. And any games that you would think of, uh, Brad or Ben? I'll defer to Ben. I've been without a gaming group for more than a year now, so... Do Brad! Oh. That's horrible! Oh, oh. oh we got to hug that out. That's <laughs> and, you're in, and, and you're in Toronto, which, which ought to be a mecca for that, right? You would think so, but it's remarkably dry for gaming. Uh. Wow. Trying to th of course, now I'm scrolling through who I know in Toronto. <laughs> Robin Laws and his group. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You go to Robin. Robin. Well, I mean, the, the real world sometimes gets in the way, you know, I mean, even when you want yeah. a game, sometimes. Dad, can you help me get dressed? Yeah, for sure. Dad, can you help me get dressed? Okay. <laughs> well, there's someone talking to me, I was like, oh. <laughs> No, this is the day where I had uh, three different people to get to three different places and then had car trouble and then there was someone covered in mud. So, um... <laughs> It's all very exciting. Anyway, carrying on. In terms of a collaborative world building, if we all draw in like what else we've done today and tried to build a world from that, <laughs> how cool would that be? That would be, that would be fantastic. It really would be good. <laughs> it would, huh? Yeah. Well, and I think I think there's a the thing of going uh, when you are doing collaborative playing, what are some of the challenges, particularly when you're just starting out, what are some of the challenges that you're facing when you're trying to run that for people or in, bring it into your game? What are some of the things that you go, okay, these are some gotchas or this is something I had to struggle with? Oh, I have one. Uh, try not to write a novel. <laughs> try, to, try to write a game, not a novel. Um, if you're doing collaborative world, world gaming and you fill it and you color everything in, uh, you haven't left room for very much game. Um, so being aware of that, and, and uh, when you're doing collaborative world building, build enough of the worlds so that everybody has a sense of it, but not so much that there's no room for discovery. If, well, I'll say when. The other level of collaboration that we've seen is collaborative character building, uh, like Fate and a number of other games have done. And mm -hmm. that's e even if you're not going to, to do world building or you're going to play a more straight game, that is a great technique to bring into other you know more conventional 3.5 games. And that's about learning and listening and uh, uh, being excited about the other people's characters, and that—that's mm -hmm. one of the things you should you should do. And, and I think is a is a, a a thing is to listen and figure out what other people love about their characters. Mm -hmm. it, it, that's and and that plays then through um, and connect yourself with them. Um, uh, when we switched over to doing that sort of fate style character collaboration, I honestly was like, eh, no, no, well, okay, we'll do it. You know, it'll be eh, whatever, and. It, the players loved it um, in, in a way that, that I was sh kind of completely shocked, and now I'm like, okay, well, I have to do that every time from now on because this, the results were so strong. Um, and it was that all of them did listen to who each other, wh mm. what they wanted to play and who they were, um, and I think that's important. Yeah, and a lot. I mean, a lot of the collaborative games. That's that's baked in that you have to make your characters together. You're not allowed to show up with a character. That's <laughs> explicitly against the rules. Yeah. Um, it's very important, and even going step by step and explicitly answering like each step of the character creation together, so you know you're building some kind of synchronized characters is is very important. But to get back to the question of um, uh, things that could go wrong, I think from collaborating and then shifting from collaborative mode to a GM'd mode. Um, one possibility, this is, might be a hypothetical danger. I think I did this once. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think I did this. Uh, where you make a collaborative setting together, say, you, like Microscope, you make some very big setting, and then you as the GM think, ah, I think this part is awesome, and this is where I want to set the game, and this is what I want to explore. But because the players now 
now know all this other stuff, they might have been much more interested or over here. Or maybe one of them's interested in this, one of them's interested in that. So you go here, and they're kind of like, oh, okay, well, that's, that's, that's not the part that I really liked. And they're probably going to be cool about it, but in a normal game, I mean, the, the, the kind of the gentleman's agreement is the, you made the game, I will go where you said the game is, because that's, you prepared the game. But now that I know about the entire world, I might be like, hey, you know what, you made the wrong choice. You went to the wrong place. Uh, which I don't, I've never seen people be weird about it, but I could see a little bit of like a little tiny broken heart. Um, like, oh, I said we're going to go to the ziggurats, but I guess we're in a city doing merchant stuff. Fine. So that, that might be something. I'm sure there's a step in between where you could kind of maybe collaboratively, after you collaboratively decide. make it collaboratively decide, and you can collaboratively do every step. Okay. Or you could say, all right, you know, we're going to be in your city doing, doing uh, merchanty stuff for four sessions, and then we're going to go to the ziggurats. If you're good, okay. if you're good, you get to go to the ziggurats. <laughs> <laughs> if you're bad, then you stay Mer here doing merchanty stuff. <laughs> well, let, let me, Brad, let me, let me ask you, because you're building a whole, everybody gets essentially gets to build a world. How do you find that, that the GM then decides where to play, or the group decides where to play in that? Well, one of the interesting things I find that, that kind of negates the, the, this hypothesis of, of people getting stuck on their own work is when we, do the, when we build the cluster and everybody's got their own world or maybe a pair of worlds that they've developed, and then we shift to character generation, and one of the first things that you do is pick where your character grew up, partially because that's going to define who the character is and, and how they start, but also because it gives you a little bit more power to elaborate the world when you start writing a little backstory you're, you're adding to, to the history of, of whatever it is you chose as your home world. It is actually remarkably rare, in my experience, for players to choose a world that they created as their home world. Mm. So there, we wind up with a lot of intermeshed stories and with people elaborating other people's ideas. And it might also be that my referee style is, is, is very travelogue in a lot of ways. We're going to visit the ziggurats. <laughs> <laughs> because we're not writing a novel, no matter how much we all speak at the table about what the world is, in the end what gets written down is three short phrases, the aspects for the world. So we've all talked about all these things about the world, but these three short phrases are what's really important. And those are things that we're going to go and see and do and interact with or be complicated by, no question. Um, and uh, again, that's probably something that should be written in the rules. So I've always said I'm not good. <laughs> but after this, I might have to go through my notes. <laughs> okay, so I've got one last little little question for all of you. Um, one of the things was is when Lowell first played Microscope and he used it for a campaign history setting for the thing. You sort of put that out there on some of the forum sites and things. Some other people tried it and a lot of them came back and said, oh well you know it's just history, what do you do with it, blah, or whatever. And one of the, the ideas that their game group had come up with that was so beautiful was they made a world where all of the agriculture was done on the backs of giant sea turtles. And then he posted, and there was nothing to be done with that. So as we head out, from each of you, I'd like one idea what you would do with the world in which all of the agriculture was done on the back of giant sea turtles. Oh, I would love that. That would be so uh, cool. Uh, I'll play that right now. That's a complex world, and it's awesome. And oh, my goodness. Okay. Uh, can, I, can I play one of the turtles? That's the yeah. thing for Turtle. Yeah. <laughs> I can see an entire campaign of everyone playing. <laughs> Very slowly moving towards each other. <laughs> oh my god. Sea turtle rustlers. Yeah, sea turtle. Enormous catastrophes. So I think clearly the turtles are dying off and there's some terrible, terrible problem. Well, what, if we were, what if we were young, like sub adult turtles with some sort of strange. Superpowers. <laughs> <laughs> and he lived in Stuber. <laughs> well, I mean, the nice thing would be, uh, I mean, if, if another country was invading you, you'd know they're heading towards you slowly. Yeah, you could see you it. Got about <laughs> 10 years until they get here, but you know, prepare for that cultural collision when it happens. <laughs> yeah. 
No. I would play okay. that game. Yeah. Yeah, I know. That's it. It's it's just that one core idea. It was amazing. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I do want to thank you guys for this awesome um, discussion on some of the diff different ways to bring this sort of richness to your games. There are so many ways, and every one of the products that these people are associated with, Ben Robbins with Microscope and Kingdom, both are amazing. And Brad Murray's uh, Diaspora and Hollow Point, beautifully engineered systems that will deliver the game that you want to play. And the lovely lyrical games <laughs> of McGay Baker with uh, Valiant Girls, which I just think is just such a lovely little little idea, as well as One Thousand and One Nights mm -hmm. and Siren, which is literally you have you know you have powers, psychic powers, you have and amnesia. amnesia. <laughs> yeah, and go, go. run, no, <laughs> which is, no, just which go, is, run. Is <laughs> improvisation, collaboration <laughs> at its best. And and Lil, I want to thank you for your work on Age of Ravens. Um, uh, speaking about gaming and your experiences with that, and also your podcast play on Target. Thank you very much, all of you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And now we'll end the hangout.